Okay. Written by Alex Garland and directed by Danny Boyle, 28 Days Later is a post-apocalyptic horror film that follows a group trying to survive the aftermath of the rage virus in the UK, a virulent, blood-borne pathogen that sends its hosts into a state of extreme, uncontrollable rage. Paying homage to classic zombie films like George Romero's Dawn of the Dead, British sci-fi novels such as The Day of the Triffids, and the Resident Evil games, the film is an unrelenting horror and fascinating study of morality during a time of crisis. Listen, we're going and we're taking your torture victims with us. The animals are contagious! One fight! Stop! Stop! You have no idea! <laughs> As detailed in the prequel graphic novel, 28 Days Later, Aftermath, the rage virus was created by two Cambridge scientists, Clive and Warren. The pair were hired to try and isolate the specific neurochemicals that cause anger and excessive aggression in humans. To better understand their work and the ramifications of their actions, we must first take a look inside the brain and see how they went about this. The cerebral cortex is the thinking part of the brain, where logic and judgement reside, while the emotional centre of the brain is the limbic system. Within the limbic system is a small structure called the amygdala, a storehouse for emotional memories that is also responsible for our fight or flight response, our natural survival instincts. The data coming in from the world around us passes through the amygdala, where the decision is made whether to send the data to the limbic or cortex area of the brain. If the incoming data triggers enough of an emotional charge, the amygdala can override the cortex, which means the information will be sent to the limbic system, causing them to act emotionally rather than logically. During an overriding event, the amygdala goes into action without much regard for the consequences, since this area of the brain is not involved in judging, thinking, or evaluating. This reactive incident has come to be known as an amygdala hijacking, and both Clive and Warren were essentially hoping to stop this process in its tracks. In a typical person, when the amygdala is hijacked, a flood of hormones are released that cause physical and emotional alarm, leading to a number of possible emotions. A surge of energy follows, preparing the person for a fight or flight response, and it can take up to 20 minutes for a person to calm down and move from functioning away within the emotional area to the thinking part of the brain. Now, their aim was essentially to develop an inhibitor that could alter the neurochemical makeup of the amygdala, stunting anger and natural human response. After they successfully prevented this amygdala hijacking from occurring in a test subject, Warren believed that widespread delivery with a pill or spray wouldn't do, and stupidly decided to use the Ebola virus as a delivery system. However, within two weeks, several isolated genomes in the Ebola virus reacted to the inhibitor and mutated, causing it to have the opposite effect. Within an instant, their life's work and breakthroughs in neuroscience had been undone. Instead of inhibiting anger, it forced the infected to live in a permanent state of fight or flight. This supercharged amygdala hijacking, without a natural off switch, caused hosts to become full of constant, uncontrollable rage, a sickness that would be known as the rage virus. While Warren worked on a treatment to undo what they created, Clive quit in disgust and informed the Animal Freedom Front of their experiments. The only issue is that he neglected to mention the animals were infected with a horrific virus and could not be released. As a result, they break into the lab and free one of the infected chimps, kickstarting the outbreak. Within the next 13 days, society broke down and Great Britain was overrun by rage. Apart from a few scattered survivors, the rest of the population were either dead, infected, or had escaped during the exodus. It started as writing, and right from the beginning you knew this was different. Because it was happening in small villages, and then it wasn't on the TV anymore. It was in the street outside, it was coming through your windows. While its psychological symptoms are more like those of rabies, the rage virus is essentially a recombinant strain of Ebola that retains some of its physiological symptoms. When a person made contact with infected blood through a wound or drops landing in the eyes or mouth, they would transform into an infected in less than 30 seconds. During this process, they suffer from violent, uncontrollable convulsions. The infection also causes capillaries to hemorrhage, making them vomit blood and bleed from the eyes and nose, before their eyes turn scarlet red. The infected will then experience sudden, uncontrollable anger and extreme aggression, heightened mobility and endurance, and a loss of higher intelligence. From that point, they will seek out and viciously attack anyone that they find. Mark? It might be your brother or your sister or your oldest friend. It makes no difference. And just so you know where you stand, if it happens to you, I'll do it in a heartbeat. 
28 days after the outbreak, a courier named Jim, played by Killian Murphy, wakes up alone on a hospital bed, having undergone brain surgery following an accident. Disoriented, and with no one around to help, our confused protagonist begins to explore his surroundings. As he walks the lengthy halls and observes a completely abandoned lobby, his confusion only intensifies. Every phone line is dead, papers and debris are scattered about, and despite his yells for help, there are no traces of human life. No! Heading into the heart of London, he discovers more of the same and stumbles upon a board with dozens of missing person photos, along with newspapers informing of a citywide evacuation. With night beginning to fall, Jim heads to a nearby chapel for refuge. Unfortunately, he's greeted by a mountain of bodies and a handful of infected. Struck by terror, he flees from certain death and is saved by experienced survivors Naomi Harris's Selena and Noah Huntley's Mark. Taking refuge in a gated convenience store, they inform Jim about the recent evacuation and viral outbreak. Finding his parents dead by self-inflicted overdose at their home, they're soon overrun by infected and Mark is bitten, leaving Selena no choice but to brutally hack him to death with their machete. After being saved by Brendan Gleeson's Frank and his daughter Hannah, who have taken refuge in their apartment complex, they pick up a radio frequency from soldiers that promise safety and shelter. With their supplies of water running out, the four team up and head towards Manchester. Driving in Frank's cab, trenches of bodies line the streets and serve as scenery, further exacerbating the bleakness of their situation. Following a narrow escape in an underground tunnel, they find the base completely abandoned, and during a fit of frustration, Frank is infected by a drop of blood that lands in his eye. Dad, you're all right. Hannah, I love you very much. Stay where you are. Dad? Keep away from me! Dad? Keep away from me! Keep away from me! Away from me! To their surprise, the trio are rescued by soldiers who lead them back to a fortified mansion serving as their primary base. There they meet Christopher Eccleston's Major Henry West, leader of the off-kilter squad. The answer to infection. Well, as I said before, it's here, though it may not be quite what you imagined. Mailer? Jim. Jim. Mailer. He's telling me he's futureless. And eventually he'll tell me how long the infected take to starve to death. With no oversight, Wes has essentially lost his mind. Instead of trying to lead them out of the country, he's embraced this apocalypse and wishes only to keep his men happy. In addition to keeping an infected human chained up in the yard for quote-unquote research, he admits that his ultimate goal is to rebuild civilization and that he intends on using Selena and Hannah to repopulate. Jim and one of the sergeants try to stop this and are quickly detained and led to their execution. Possessed by unbridled rage, Jim manages to escape and returns to the mansion to claim his revenge. Using the infected to swarm the group and hunting the soldiers down one by one, he exhibits natural, unhinged raw aggression, resulting in one of the most visceral, eye-gouging scenes in the film. This moment also reinforces how wrong Clive and Warren were in trying to remove our primal rage, seeing how it's a necessary survival instinct. During their escape, Jim is shot in the stomach but is saved in time by Selena and Hannah. 28 days after the mansion battle, the trio, now living peacefully in a picturesque cabin, catch the attention of a plane, leading to their much-deserved rescue. Despite Selena initially stating that in this new world, survival should always supersede morality. Good people. Yeah. You should be more concerned about whether they're going to slow you down. Right, because if they slowed you down... I'd leave them behind. In a heartbeat. Yeah. Through their journey, she comes to realize that, without morality, there isn't much point in survival. Ultimately, starvation is the proverbial nail in the coffin for the rage virus, ending the initial outbreak. And after approximately two months, with no animals or humans to consume, the infected are reduced to skeletal husks, left to wither away. Here, it should be noted that there were three alternate endings that can be found in the DVD extras, all of which conclude with Jim dying. Two were filmed, and the third, a more radical departure, was presented only in storyboards. Okay, so this is the radical alternative ending. We wondered what would happen to the story if we didn't have the soldiers at all, and that the film stayed as a small, very small group of people and didn't open up at all. She's 14, and her dad is infected. If you know of a way to cure him, it would be good if you'd just tell us. There's a catch. The infection's in the blood. So change the blood, and there's no infection. And that was the problem right there with this ending. We'd established that one drop in the eye will infect someone. Then how the flying fuck are we going to sell the idea that this blood transfusion idea is going to work? They do the transfusion as they're attacked by infected. And then Selena, Hannah, and Frank enter the room with the man. Jim lies strapped to the operating table, infected. 
Released in 2002 in the UK, it quickly made back its production budget, exceeding expectations. It was then released in the US in the summer of 2003, quickly becoming one of the most popular films of the year, despite its limited screening. At the end of its theatrical run, the film had made over $45 million in the US and over $85 million worldwide. The influence of 28 Days Later cannot be understated. It essentially helped rejuvenate the genre, leading to many films starting to inject some speed into their zombies. This also bled over into video games, with games like Left 4 Dead following suit with variants of fast infected enemies. In the decades that followed, in addition to collaborating with each other, both Boyle and Garland have gone on to direct some amazing films of their own, many of which have been covered on the channel, links in the description. While neither of them was involved in the 2007 sequel, 28 Weeks Later, as recently as 2019, the pair have stated that they're developing an original concept to finish the trilogy, one that would likely take place 28 months later. However, until the project is greenlit by a studio, or officially announced, we should probably keep our expectations in check. 